We are training the next generation to meet the strategic challenges of tomorrow. We are dedicated to understanding in order to act better. Our last but not least panel uh, today will be chaired by Heather DeSantis from Public Safety, Safety Canada. Let me remind everyone that participants' full bio uh, are available on the program online. Heather, thank you for taking the time to be with us today. The floor is yours. Merci beaucoup. Um, C'est vraiment un plaisir d'être ici avec vous et avec uh, tous les universitaires et chercheurs et étudiantes. Um, C'est vraiment un travail important d'étudier les thèmes importants de ce domaine. So thank you very much, uh, Justin, to you and your team for the organization of this conference to come and the network, but also to our academics who really um, provide uh, to practitioners like me um, important conversations and discussions on the critical themes uh, within the world of intelligence, which I think all of our panels have done very nicely today in exploring. And we have the um, great pleasure of being the final panel, which will hopefully uh, pull all the themes together, but also introduce uh, some new concepts, including, I think, a very good discussion on multipolarity, which is indeed uh, in the title of our conference today. Um, we will be having three excellent presentations uh, from Reg Whitaker from the University of Victoria on intelligence cooperation in historical perspectives from Cold War bi bipolarity to the multipolar present, followed by Nancy Tipo from the Royal Military College of Canada on enhanced ISR on its and its effect on strategic stability, and Patrick Walsh from Charles Stewart University, a, a very interesting perspective from the other side of the world, and uh, he is with um, Australia National, excuse me, he'll be speaking about Australia's national intelligence community, challenges and opportunities in a multipolar world. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Rich. Please uh, go ahead. Are you not coming out here? There we go. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, um, I'm. I'm here really to talk about uh, the uh, the past and where uh, Canadian intelligence cooperation comes from. But hopefully that gives us some pointers about where it may be going in the future and where it should not go in the future. Uh, and I'll start uh, with the uh, ground zero, really, of post-war intelligence cooperation and the beginning of the bipolar Cold War world in 1945, just at the conclusion of World War II. Uh, and uh, and uh, that was the moment when uh, Soviet cipher clerk uh, Igor Gazenko defected to the uh, uh, Canadian, uh, sorry, uh, defected to Canada from the Soviet embassy uh, with a sheaf of documents indicating extensive uh, uh, Soviet military intelligence operations uh, in Canada on its erstwhile wartime ally, but also with many hints of the much wider range of Soviet intelligence across uh, the Western world. And, uh, and, and that, moment uh, was really the first shots fired in the Cold War. So they happened right here in Canada. And, uh, and Canada was very unprepared at that point for anything of that nature, certainly unprepared to be in the front line of, uh, of, um, of any uh, uh, confrontation with the Soviet Union uh, in, on the international stage. Uh, but uh, was also unprepared for the ramifications domestically. And uh, immediately help was on the way with our traditional uh, ally, uh, Britain, uh, which was really still at this point the, our most important ally at the end of the, of the war. Uh, and MI5 in Britain was immediately on the scene in Canada and really, uh, that along with the FBI from, uh, from the US, that cooperation in terms of how Gazenko was going to be handled, how we were going to actually uh, use this from a counterintelligence uh, uh, perspective, uh, was uh, fully uh, integrated into a kind of Anglosphere of intelligence cooperation. 
in which uh, the RCMP played a uh, key role internally in Canada, but uh, on the wider side, it was it, it was coming from uh, uh, from the Brits uh, in particular, uh, and uh, that was a, a a paradigm really in terms of intelligence sharing that went on through the Cold War, which was that Canada, what Canada had to offer was uh, the uh, possibility of, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, information on Canadians or things that happened in Canada in exchange for the wider foreign intelligence, which we didn't really have the capacity to gather on any large scale. And of course, that famous and non-decision on uh, a foreign intelligence agency uh, played into that. Um, so um, I, I would say that uh, uh, the, that ha that kind of relationship uh, had paid off enormous benefits to Canada over the years. There's no question about that. Access to a range of intelligence that we would never have had on our uh, on our own, uh, and th there's no questioning that. But it also had some downsides and. Uh, and I'll just try to throw out a few of them because they're they're really quite uh, pertinent, I think, in the in the in the longer term. Uh, one of them was uh, that became uh, apparent, and it wasn't necessarily a downside at the at the time. But uh, the Canadian Prime Minister at the time, Mackenzie King, suddenly and rather unaccountably decided uh, that in the middle of where they were uh, worked out a way of dealing with the Kazenko affair uh, at the highest level with uh, President Truman and with Prime Minister Attlee and with all the uh, with the intelligence agencies and, uh, on the three countries. Uh, and uh, and then King suddenly decided he was going to go off on his own. And uh, he was just going to get the Soviet ambassador to inform uh, Stalin uh, about what was happening here in Canada somehow on the uh, notion that Stalin didn't know and that he would put a stop to this. And I was <laughs> completely harebrained scheme uh, and I have no doubt about that but uh, but how it was stopped was that in fact MI5 and uh, it just jumped right in and uh, got the RCMP to make sure that they got to speak to King and and in speaking to King the RCMP uh, invoked J. Edgar Hoover in the West and said this would be a terrible idea that they're, they're following up all sorts of leads which would be uh, negated if you go ahead by this and King was chastened and so on and, and backed off. So now we have a very weird situation here. On the one hand, as I say, it was a harebrained scheme that the prime minister came up with uh, and the, and the uh, counterintelligence uh, damages that would have been done if they'd followed that would have been immense. But um, but on the other hand, it, he was the uh, you know the elected leader of the, uh, in Canada who decided to invoke national security uh, or national sovereignty, excuse me, and uh, and uh, and and uh, pursue a made in Canada solution, and that was stopped by the concerted cross border uh, 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 actions of the intelligence professionals in the three countries. Uh, and that set a tone, uh, I think, uh, for the how cooperation was really best or was going to be carried out in the future. Now, a second problem uh, of, 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 the, of this arrangement was the vulnerability of Canadians to the misuse of the uh, information on them uh, that would be uh, that that was possible on on the uh, once the, that information was sent to the U.S. Uh, and the first and tragic example of this was the the uh, suicide of the Canadian ambassador to um, to, uh, uh, to to Egypt uh, in 1957, Herbert Norman after old allegations about Norman being an alleged Soviet agent had been uh, brought up by American witch hunting committees uh, and once again were brought up uh, and Norman hounded uh, to his, was hounded to his death. And uh, the, the point here was that in fact, the RCMP had passed information to the FBI, uh, which was highly misleading about Norman 
and that that information then Hoover had passed to the Congressional Committee uh, because that was what Hoover did. And, uh, and that once that information got into the hands of the committee, they misused it and, uh, and led to, uh, to Norman's death. And, and there were ser serious questions raised at the time about whether or not uh, that uh, you know, intelligence cooperation could really continue if this was what was uh, going to happen. That didn't occur and, and they papered over the differences and went on. But uh, fast forward another four decades and uh, the Cold War is over and uh, it's now a question of uh, the global war on terror after 9-11 and a Canadian, uh, uh, Mayor Arar, uh, who happened to be a person of interest in an RCMP uh, or a joint intelligence investigation in, uh, in Canada of terrorism, uh, which had been set up under intense pressure from the Americans. Uh, and uh, uh, the RCMP had simply uh, in the infamous data dump where they took everything they had in their investigation and hand handed it over to the FBI. Uh, and uh, Arar's uh, simple appearance in there of simply being a person of interest, uh, but with a quite improper notation by the RCMP that he was a dangerous Islamic extremist. They had no evidence of that. Uh, it, it, that, uh, that was enough to get Arar arrested uh, or actually kidnapped uh, in transit at New York airport and sent to Syria for a year in, in, uh, uh, in a Syrian prison and torture. And uh, when he was finally released and came back to Canada, uh, it ultimately came down to uh, the RCMP commissioner had to resign and uh, Arar was given $10 million or more in, in uh, compensation. So, um, you know, this is not a, this is, this is a, a long-standing problem, which has continued uh, over the years. Um, as the uh, Cold War consensus um, massed, I think there was another downside, which was uh, to this kind of intelligence cooperation, which was uh, the kind of interpretation that uh, other countries, in particular the United States, which of course had taken over from Britain early by the early 1950s as the leader of the Western uh, world, uh, put on, on, uh, on, on the intelligence which they were sharing so generously with Canada. And whether that always accorded with Canadian national uh, interests, or was it uh, possibly reflecting more American national interests? Well, um, that was masked as long as the Cold War consensus held pretty strongly. But, uh, but it, it was a problem as well when you had things like, uh, when there were differences within the wider Western alliance. And I found it very interesting uh, uh, incident that, or a series of incidents really that happened when uh, after de Gaulle made his infamous Vive le Quebec Libre speech in the, in the late 1960s. And uh, Canada found itself a bit uh, bereft of, of information as to what the strategic goals of, of France were in relation to the you know, Quebec independence and the various uh, movements within Canada. Uh, along that line and, uh, and really needed some help. They went, my sources tell me they, uh, the RCMP uh, security service went to the Americans and asked them uh, if, if they could enlighten them as to what the, uh, the French were about. And the Americans said, well, sorry, you know, we'd really like to help, but France is an ally and it's not really proper for us to comment on them. Uh, <laughs> The um, uh, and then you had the uh, uh, the uh, they went to the British and they got basically the same answer, and uh, this led to problems later when the spying that went on in Quebec uh, on the Parti Québécois, a legitimate uh, political party that uh, that was also the government of Canada or the government of Quebec after 1976. Uh, and, uh, and, and that, uh, and the peak and the peak, but they were, they were really worried about, uh, that trying to get the find whether there was any French, uh, you know, sort of clandestine, uh, behavior going on here. They never did find it, but it, it caused a, an awful lot of problems internally. And, uh, and the 
form of the intelligence exchange that that, that Canada had wasn't really helping uh, in that regard. Uh, well, I'll just go on uh, and gl and sort of run over a few other incidents. But as the as the terrorism became more and more a problem, of course, domestically, uh, it, the it Quebec, uh, which was outside the Cold War consensus. Uh, and uh, certainly by October 1970, with the uh, October crisis and the War Measures Act and, and the uh, assassination of a Quebec cabinet minister, et cetera, et cetera, uh, this was a serious uh, set of issues. And, and these were ones that uh, Canadian intelligence had to basically work on themselves. Uh, but uh, terrorism in the wider sense, international terrorism, uh, grew with in 1976, the uh, Montreal Olympics were uh, held in the, uh, the previous Olympics in Munich. There had been a massacre of Israeli athletes by Palestinian terrorists. And there was a huge security operation that was mounted and uh, Canada greatly increased the number of uh, contacts around the world. Uh, as part of that, uh, really widened its sort of global scope uh, for intelligence exchange. Uh, and uh, since nothing happened at the Montreal Olympics, they managed to get through without a problem. Uh, that seemed, was deemed a, a, a very considerable success. But that was not the same. The following decade, 1985, the worst uh, terrorist incident uh, in Canadian history, and in fact, still to this day, the worst air uh, uh, terrorist incident, uh, Air India. 329 people died, uh, plus two baggage handlers in, in, uh, in, to <coughs> excuse me, in Tokyo. And, uh, and, uh, and we, we, not to put too fine a point on it, made pretty much of a hash out of uh, both of preventing it, certainly in the first instance, and, uh, and then of investigating and bringing criminal charges uh, in, uh, in the wake of of that, so that was a disaster, and and I worked uh, for the Air India Commission uh, and uh, looking at the air security aspects of it, and it was very interesting to see that in fact Indian uh, intelligence that was offered to Canada was treated very differently by the RCMP on the one hand and by CSIS on the other hand. Uh, and CSIS was suspicious that, in fact, uh, the Indians were putting a particular slant on uh, this in terms of their uh, kind of domestic crusade against uh, Sikh extremism, and Sikhs being responsible clearly for the uh, the bombing of, of Air India. Uh, I would make any comment on that other than to say that that pointed to a larger problem which is that uh, when you have regional conflicts that burst over into Canada uh, and you're reliant for intelligence on one party to those regional conflicts, uh, that uh, you have to be very careful about how you interpret at least uh, they, uh, the particular slant that they're, they're providing. Um, I'll just end, however, on a somewhat more optimistic note, uh, and that has to do with uh, what we now know about the American decision, American-British decision to go in and to invade Iraq in uh, 2003, uh, and the fact that Canada, of course, did not join in that, uh, in that and despite very heavy pressure from both the Americans and the British. And we now know that, in fact, Canadian, some elements, at least of the Canadian intelligence community, uh, were able to see through the uh, fraudulent uh, intelligence about weapons of mass destruction that were used as justification for that war by the Americans and the British. Uh, and uh, it's just a, a kind of closure, I suppose, as we move into a somewhat more multipolar world uh, from where we started back in 1945, that uh, here it was our two closest allies, uh, Americans and the British, uh, and this time we weren't any longer uh, following them, uh, at least we, we, we took a buy on that one. So I'll just stop there. 
Thank you very much, Reg. Um, you remind us all of uh, these profound um, events that have shaped uh, the history of an intelligence in Canada and are stark reminders of um, how um, intelligence uh, cooperation and sharing just must be done in a way that is uh, caveated and um, prudent and with all the accountability and transparency um, that comes with it. So thank you very much. And I know that um, your commentary on um, though subtle, I think was there on the, pol the politicization of intelligence and um, intelligence organizations. And I think that that's been um, a bit of a theme throughout the day. So I look forward to exploring that in our question and answer session with the panelists. So thank you very much. Um, Nancy, I will turn it over to you for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Heather. I appreciate that. And thank you to Justin Massey and the Network for Strategic Analysis for inviting me to this amazing event and being on a panel with such distinguished scholars on intelligence. Um, I confess I'm not an intelligence practitioner. I'm a strategic analyst. So I'm going to be speaking more to the uh, strategic dimension and its implications. Um, but uh, my discussion will touch on uh, sharing and links of uh, information with allies and partners. Uh, so my paper explores uh, how a state's advantage in intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance uh, capability to identify, locate, track, and target its adversary strategic assets can be potentially destabilizing, risking escalation in crises, uh, crisis competition between peer or near-peer nuclear powers. Um, so a great deal of my work since 2014 has dealt with the strategic competition between the U.S. and Russia, uh, but China as a revisionist state and near-peer competitor is rapidly modernizing its strategic nuclear and conventional capabilities and is emerging as a, a key player in regional and global strategic competition, uh, shifting the international system from a dyadic nuclear competition to a multipolar international competition, um, some have described as a security trilemma. Uh, in the current context, uh, we're seeing the modernization of nuclear capabilities of Russia, China, and the United States with expanding air and missile defense, provocative exercises and postures, and developments in conventional counterforce weapons. Uh, traditional deterrence, uh, deterrence by punishment uh, was part of the calculus since the Cold War, but deterrence by denial became part of the flexible options to have both the capability to target the other side's nuclear launch platforms, also known as counterforce targeting, and threaten counter value targets such as cities. In the current era, there's been an emphasis on denial strategies, which now include not long range uh, conventional strike options, creating an entanglement of nuclear and conventional strategic forces, including dual capable delivery platforms. This introduces complexity into the deterrence and stability calculus of modern strategic competition. Intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance ca capabilities are likewise modernizing to gain strategic advantage or rather dominance and globally networked partners in sensor technology and data sharing. My study of the impact of enhanced ISR on strategic stability builds upon the works of Austin Long and Brandon Green, Kier Lieber and Daryl Press, as well as Rebecca Herzman, Bernadette Stadler and Lisa Maria Arias at the CIS, CSIS uh, uh, project on uh, nuclear issues, the one in Washington, DC, the other CIS, CSIS. These works explore the impact of remote sensing technologies and improve situational awareness used to locate and target relocatable nuclear platforms such as ballistic missile submarines and mobile land-based systems. They argue that superior situational awareness erodes the foundation of traditional deterrence, risking escalation and strategic instability. These capabilities are particularly problematic as ISR systems are increasingly tasked for both nuclear and conventional missions, uh, both at the theater and then broader global strategic level. Herzman, Stadler, and Arias describe the difference between the passive early warning systems of the Cold War, which were detection systems to warn of incoming missiles after launch and assumed to be more stabilizing, contrasted with today's more predictable systems that provide insight into an adversary's capabilities actions and intentions, providing warning before launch so that decision makers can both react to and anticipate crises. When Herzman and her, her team uh, wrote this in 2019, they were thinking ahead of their time. Uh, NORAD and US NORTHCOM have released strategic guidance documents for a globally integrated layered system of sensors. Um, artificial intelligence and machine enabled information processing and a cloud computing architecture to detect threats and deter and defeat if necessary. 
This system, Joint All Domain Command and Control, enables the U.S. to achieve all domain awareness, information dominance, and decision superiority. The system is in response to the long-range conventional threats to the continent, but such systems are dual capable. This entanglement may also be blurring, blurring the lines between the shield comprising uh, NORAD and U.S. NORTHCOM and the sword comprising Strategic Command. Uh, strategic Command platforms uh, performs uh, counterforce and countervalue targeting, whereas the shield undertakes the integrated air and missile defense rule, which may also include targeting platforms under the deterrence by denial function involving left of launch. In addition to being a system enabled, uh, a system enabling NORAD, which involves Canada as a defense partner, plans uh, including integrating the five eyes and one must also assume uh, NATO into this architecture. There are challenges in opening linkages, including establishing suitable policy standards and technological adjustments for data fusion and data sharing with allies, particularly releasing US generated data to mission partners. So what does this mean for strategic stability? In a competitive zero sum uh, way of thinking, advantage to one creates disadvantages and vulnerabilities in another. The disadvantaged competitor will seek to offset the advantage through asymmetric means. The potential blurring of offensive and defensive missions, in addition to advancing ISR capabilities and information sharing with allies and partners such as the Five Eyes, NORAD, and NATO, intended to close the vulnerability gap in North American defense, and by extension, we can assume gaps in allies' defenses. Uh, these may be perceived as threatening by near peer adversaries. Lieber and Press describe rapidly advancing technological developments in remote sensing, data processing, and communication, which they refer to as an age of unprecedented transparency. JADC2 and the Pathfinder Data Ecosystem Initiative demonstrates technological innovation to improve information sharing and cooperation with allies. However, the sharing of information provided by these capabilities adds to the provocation that intensifies a security dilemma. So my work looked at uh, potential advantages and disadvantages um, with implications for strategic stability uh, that could impact the interests of allies and partners as well. Uh, disadvantages include countermeasures. In seeking to close the vulnerability gap created by American superiority in counterforce capabilities and ISR, strategic competitors like Russia and China are seeking to exploit vulnerabilities in Western early warning systems, particularly the space and cyber domains. Early warning systems are vulnerable to ASATs or anti-satellite capabilities, uh, conventional missiles and cyber attacks. Communication systems and radars are also vulnerable to threats in the electromagnetic spectrum, which can disrupt, disable, or spoof the transfer of early warning information. Uh, these and other efforts to obstruct advanced sensor and strike systems include the use of decoys, timing of movements to evade satellites, and minimizing communications to obstruct signals intelligence efforts. Another disadvantage is concealment. Western ISR advantages may embolden adversaries to conceal strategic assets and military activities to avoid detection, to avoid becoming a target. Adversaries will also innovate capabilities that can threaten the homeland by co covertly bypassing early warning detection designed for missiles. And one must think of the, the Russian release of the Poseidon uh, underwater um, submarine launched torpedo uh, drone that could come to you know, the coast of North America without any kind of knowledge or detection. A third is the human element. Uh, intelligence collected is subject to interpretation and potential biases of analysts, commanders, and policymakers, in addition to the purposes for which the intelligence is being used. And Reg alluded to this in regards to um, uh, reasons for uh, invading Iraq, for example. JADC2, allowing for most processes to be carried out by machines created for, uh, create space for humans on the loop to better understand the battle space, facilitating more informed decisions. Um, this may reduce risks associated with bias, political manipulation, and disregard of contradictory information as cap capabilities approach near perfect intelligence. However, questions remain about human oversight on machine-enabled processes, uh, and these should be, remain a concern as uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning systems themselves may develop their own biases or impose values distinct from those of the commanders using the processed information to respond to various scenarios. Finally, um, the exploitation of humans. Um, the emphasis on enhanced ISR and U.S. Western strategic advantage is countered by the asymmetric espionage capability that Russia has been conducting in the West for decades. 
and the increasing Chinese espionage in North America. Cyber espionage remains a critical concern for accessing industrial designs for capabilities that have military applications. On the other hand, advantages uh, include um, advances in ISRs that can reduce uncertainty and errors related to unreliable and unverifiable information on adversaries' behavior, capabilities, and location of activity. Um, one of the advantages involves facilitating arms control verification, which is a benefit to allies and partners. Uh, strategic stability is associated with uh, mechanisms to constrain arms racing and proliferation through bi- and multilateral arms, arms control agreements. Uh, ensuring that signatories comply with treaty provisions uh, involves verification and transparency measures, including systems for reporting and inspections. These processes are intended to reduce the uncertainty and build trust, confidence, and security among state actors. They are intended to reduce the risks of misunderstanding and miscalculation. Related to this, ISR monitors for treaty violations and deployment of prohibited offensive systems. Uh, another advantage is the prevention of nuclear launch based on false warning or, or accidents. Uh, verification through triangulating information from imagery, signals, and communication with the state in which the error occurred could prevent wrong targeting, the unattended crossing of boundaries, and sending the wrong signal. Uh, and the third advantage relates to the second that I just discussed, that enhanced ISR contributes to deterrence by detection by communicating knowledge of an adversary's actions and demonstrating the resolve to respond to acts of aggression. Today's challenge is deterring threats below the nuclear threshold involving long-range conventional capabilities, or even below the threshold of conflict, actions in the gray zone, including cyber, information domain, and the electromagnetic spectrum. The challenge involves distinguishing actions within systems linked to both the strategic and theater levels and whether an action at the theater level may provoke a response at the strategic level. So in conclusion, in exploring the strategic challenges created by asymmetric advantage and counterforce supported by enhanced ISR, this work argues that the role of ISR in the entanglement of nuclear and non-nuclear weapons creates instability that leads adversaries to deploy asymmetric countermeasures against American and allies' vulnerabilities in multiple domains. However, advantages, ar advantages arise from uh, faster information processing and dissemination at the speed of relevance. As integrated systems provide for all domain awareness and information superiority, moving decisions further left could prevent escalation through providing a range of options for engaging the adversary before the threat materializes. The benefits through advantages in ISR outweigh the disadvantages. Currently, closing the gaps in situational awareness remain a challenge, particularly in integrating formerly siloed systems, integrating partners and allies into the globally networked system of systems, and gaps in capability in geographical regions with uniquely challenging atmospheric conditions like the Arctic. As the US seeks to close the gaps in partnerships with its Western allies, adversaries will nevertheless continue to seek out vulnerabilities to exploit. So I'll end it there. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present here today. Thank you very much, Nancy, for that very thought-provoking paper and I think really you're speaking about a very um, particular and pointy part of the intelligence world that it picked up on all of the themes that we have talked about today in terms of um, multipolarity and um, transparency as well as collection and how we use that to um, lever, use as, as levers um, in the world as these asymmetries between power struggles emerge. So thank you so much for that. Um, uh, finally, um, we have um, Patrick Walsh, who is going to speak to us about the Australian perspective. Um, and uh, we look very forward to um, his perspective on, uh, on uh, his paper, but also on the themes from today. Patrick, are you there? Uh, yes. Yeah. Can you hear me okay, Heather? I can see you. Welcome. Thank you. Um, well, hello, everyone. Greetings from Sydney, where it's six o'clock in the morning on Friday. Um, and uh, I'm sorry I didn't get the some of the earlier uh, discussion today, but I was uh, would have been a bit too uh, bridged too far for me to get out of bed that early. Um, so thank you, Justin, uh, the conference organisers for inviting me. It's very kind of you to invite to me to this very important uh, dialogue on the intelligence cooperation. My paper, uh, which uh, the conference organisers have, it's a pretty detailed paper. Um, I'm happy for people to have a look at it. But uh, what I really want to do is just hit on a couple of themes that were in that paper in, in a very short period of time, and then we can have some time uh, to discuss uh, perhaps some of the 
detail behind some of the, the brief points I make. So some people may not be aware, but in Australia, we periodically have regular independent reviews of the Australian intelligence community. Um, and the most recent one was in 2017, uh, done by two um, distinguished former national security bureaucrats, Michael Lestrange and Stephen Mershon. Uh, and essentially, uh, this was not like the previous ones we've had. It was a lot more meaty, uh, the public version of the report I was actually uh, uh, quoted in, cited in. Um, so they went out to academia much more widely than they did in the past. But the report itself had over 26 recommendations. And in fact, uh, people were expecting, you know, just the normal kind of prescriptions of former reports. So everything's OK, basically, let's just keep going. But the report was quite the opposite. It suggested that things were going OK within the intelligence community, but there needed to be a lot more. And here comes the buzzwords, better integration, better coordination better understanding of how the intelligence community in Australia can reach out and potentiate off academia, off industry, off other partners. So there was, there was a lot of interesting things. And, and in a sense, the most important recommendation was this thing called the creation of the Office of National Intelligence, which um, is similar to the ODNI in Washington, um, but it has two functions. One is to assess intelligence which is what the previous Office of National Assessments did. And, and the other is to have this enterprise-wide integration coordination function where it is meant to herd the 10 uh, agencies in, that make up the Australian intelligence community, herd them in a direction where, you know, the, the parts, the, the sum is better than the parts and that, that to sort of check standards on training and workforce issues and capability and technology issues and so on. Um, so, O and I was stood up after the Independent Intelligence Review in 2018. So looking at this report, this uh, Independent Intelligence Review report and the establishment of O and I in 2018, I thought it'd be a good idea to sort of, you know, I've written a paper earlier this year about how well O and I is going in the Intelligence Now Security Journal, people want to have a look. But what I wanted to look at it was in the context of intelligence cooperation. And a lot of the reforms that were mentioned in this report uh, didn't actually really explicitly talk about cooperation. So it was a bit, a bit of a miss really for, for the reviewers. But it did certainly mention themes which I think um, could be embraced by the intelligence community to create more opportunities for uh, cooperation measures with Five Eyes, but also with um, perhaps even more importantly, Australia's strategic partners in, in, in what's now called the Indo-Pacific. So really what the paper is about is trying to look at um, areas that the national intelligence community uh, can lever off better intelligence cooperation in, in its traditional Five Eyes Alliance post this review. And secondly, in particular, what kind of um, cooperation measures are possible with strategic partners such as Japan and India. Now, some people would have heard of the quadrilateral security dialogue or the quadrilateral security initiative, which consists of Australia, Japan, India, um, Australia, Japan, India, and the United States. Uh, and this was really um, the guardian of the uh, patron of this originally was Shinzo Abe, the former Japanese prime minister who first came out with the idea back in the sort of 2007s. And it was sort of, in, in, in those days, it was really about um, what he often would call values-based diplomacy. But increasingly, it has got uh, become more structured, more formalised, and uh, much to the chagrin of China, it's uh, who the Chinese obviously think it's, a, it's a, another diplomatic security initiative to contain China. So there's lots of synergies now between the, these quadrilateral partners. And I thought that's something I'd explore in the paper as well in terms of what's possible in cooperation space. Now, I think intelligence cooperation, if I turn to some comments from the five eyes, we tend to think of the five eyes as this monolithic thing that's been with us since the Second World War and has adapted during the Cold War to some extent during the post 9-11 environment. Uh, uh, that's true. but I think these things, 
uh, these alliances are, meant, are organic and alive and meant to meant to adjust. And uh, and I'm I'm part of the in the paper is I'm wondering if the Five Eyes has sufficiently lived out all its potential in terms of a range of different areas of intelligence cooperation. So so in terms of the the things that I focus on, they're not the technological things so much. They're more the capability, human capability uh, side of things. So in terms of the uh, five eyes, I talk about um, academic outreach, uh, intelligence training, science and technology uh, research. And in the five eyes space, I conclude that there certainly needs to be more coordinated uh, as the security environment becomes more, more complex. There needs to be a much more coordinated response within the five eyes about research and capability on a whole range of uh, emerging threats and threat priorities, which countries uh, individually in the five eyes are obviously working on with their own science and technology agenda. But these are very complex issues, very expensive issues Think about quantum computing, AI, biotechnology, and how do you respond to these issues? It would be a lot better if there's much more coordinated research and capability response in these areas. Uh, in, in terms of, um, uh, so, so, so in terms of the sort of India and, and um, Japan, where it's, where, which they are obviously not five eyes countries, and we have some history of cooperation, particularly with Japan, but less so with India, what's some of the intelligence cooperation areas that we can look at with them? Well, I, I sort of call these confidence building measures. These are sort of more lower level, level less ambitious cooperation measures, things like having analytical workshops, strategic intelligence training, joint intelligence assessments, things there where you can, maybe the bar is a bit low, but you're trying to build a, a more greater depth and breadth to those sort of relationships where, which aren't as developed as the five eyes. And in the, in the sort of second part of the paper, I, after talking a bit about some of the um, strategies for intelligence cooperation, both in the five eyes and both in the strategic partners such as India and Japan, I talk about the constraints that, that are there for both for Australia internally uh, being able to do more in the cooperation space with the Five Eyes and with India and Japan. Well, within, internally with, in Australia, uh, the, as I said, the Office of National Intelligence was just stood up in 2018. So in, in many ways, it's kind of still in its forming stage and it has this major new enterprise agenda that the government has given it and it is still trying to find its feet. So, a lot of the measures that I mentioned, which I said aren't very ambitious, are still um, probably in the short to medium term a bridge too far for O and I in terms of it's getting itself sorted around some of those issues. Um, it's not to say in the, in the sort of medium term that O and I could could actually get behind some of those measures that I mentioned in my paper. Uh, with five eyes. Um, the other issue is, you know, each, each of the five eyes countries has to see some of these intelligence cooperation measures I mentioned in more detail in my paper as, as in their national interests and seeing what their value add is. So it's not an automatic, um, well, Australia thinks this is a good idea in the five eyes, we should do this. Um, and each five eyes country is going to face um, increasingly post COVID budgetary constraints, which will impact across government and what can be done. And uh, the other interesting thing is at the moment, New Zealand, uh, which is obviously a close, we are a brother to Australia, but certainly, a, you know, always been a value, but those smaller member of the Five Eyes, recent, um, the, recently the New Zealand Foreign Minister is sort of kicking back a bit, pushing a bit, bit back, back on the Five Eyes and sort of saying, we don't want to talk about China through the prism of the Five Eyes in every aspect. So there's a kind of interesting, it's not sure how that's going to go, that sort of just as a statement made by the New Zealand Foreign Minister, but it could be evidence that, you know, some of these measures that I'm suggesting in my paper, New Zealand, uh, particularly if they're seen by New Zealand as, uh, as containing China, uh, maybe that New Zealand would not agree with those. Um, some of the other constraints to some of the intelligence cooperation strategies and measures that I mentioned in my paper, uh, obviously in terms of India and Japan, um, both of these countries have their own unique intelligence capability problems. Um, there's been, certainly in India, there's been a lot of intelligence reform since the Mumbai terrorist attacks. 
Uh, but there's still, uh, within their sort of eight intel agencies, there's still a lack of sort of horizontal and vertical cooperation, integration of intelligence. Um, the, the people, the sort of senior executives that traditionally run security intelligence, national security issues in the, in the public service in India, don't usually historically come up through intelligence or security, they come from other parts of the public service. Um, so they don't necessarily have a greater understanding of intelligence and how you can build um, greater capability internally and with other partners. Um, there's integration and intelligence sharing issues. And in Japan as well, where uh, the US have pressured Japan, you know, for decades to build more capability, not only in the military space, but in the intelligence space. Um, there is still um, problems with uh, analytical training. There's still problems with integrating intelligence in the, you know, centrally. So there are, inst in, in summary, there's institutions, which I go into in deep more detail in my paper, there are more, quite a lot of institutional barriers to, for uh, Japan and India uh, taking up some of these cooperative measures, the cooperation measures that I mentioned in my paper. So just to sum up, what do we do about this? Well, you know, I think, Incremental improvement in some of these measures is better than nothing. And, you know, so improvements can be made in lower level ambitious things, such as jo doing joint intelligence products in areas of mutual interest, such as climate change, or indeed working on health security or, you know, regional security issues. You have to be careful, of course, what kind of topics and who, you, who, who would you write them with? I mean, for example, if you wanted to write a joint intelligence assessment with India, perhaps you would be writing it on Pakistan. Uh, there might be some areas where, where, where it's not possible to do assessments. And of, obviously all those security classification issues come into play as well. Uh, what kind of singing, what kind of human do you want to share? Um, so I think that the, the sort of the take home message is there needs to be broader and deeper approach to Intel cooperation uh, that goes beyond military intelligence cooperation, which is certainly going on uh, in the Indo-Pacific region between the quadrilateral partners. But we need to see that replicated much more in the civilian-based intelligence agencies. Um, and, you know, the wild card might, in all of this might be, uh, if the security situation in Indo-Pacific deteriorates too much more, Indeed, the ultimate Intel cooperation step may be that Japan joins the Five Eyes and becomes the Six Eyes, which is actually being talked about quite a lot in Canberra and obviously in Japan. Um, and uh, we're not at that stage yet, but that that could possibly be if, uh, if the situation in the South China Sea or more broadly in the Indo-Pacific became more volatile, that could be something that, that uh, both Washington and Canberra could 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 push within the five eyes. So as, as I said, that's just a very skip through some of the uh, material in my paper, um, but there's a lot more detail in the paper itself. So thank you. Thank you very much, Patrick. Um, that was a very rich presentation. Um, you know, many of us in, in Canada and from our um, partner countries around the world and those who participate in the conference today are watching Australia and your review of your machinery around national security with great interest. And um, it's quite um, bold uh, in terms of um, making decisions about changes of machinery because we know these are not easy for bureaucracies. So thank you very much for that. I'm sure there'll be questions on that for sure. Um, I'd like to thank our three panelists for those presentations on very different topics and yet um, so much commonality and opportunities to explore. So I'll take this time to invite um, questions in the chat space. I see we have one and I'll kick it off before we go into um, specific questions from participants. Um, I'll just remind um, our panelists to speak slowly, please, because our interpreters are uh, actively um, trying to interpret you for um, our Francophone uh, participants today. So just um, picking up on uh, Patrick, our last presenter today, and I think um, there's very much uh, questions for Nancy and Reginus too. So uh, um, I'll decide who I'm gonna pick on first, but it's a question for all of you. Um, you know, uh, there's been much, um, of course, discussion in the media about this recently as well, but Patrick, you've demonstrated us too. You know, how we 
uh, in intelligence agencies of the way we cooperate can really be mired in conventional thinking. These are disciplines where um, there is tremendous risk aversion and Reg, your discussion uh, demonstrated us um, uh, errors and mistakes and uh, decisions along the way that, um, you know, um, hopefully the lessons have been learned, but nonetheless, um, errors um, being so played out so publicly and with such um, important circumstances, uh, excuse me, consequences for individuals um, create risk aversion in these agencies. So behind all of this cooperation, behind these agencies, we have bureaucracies who uh, this is their natural uh, tendency to be risk aversion. So how, um, how do we move uh, beyond this? How can we be inspired by the um, Australian model, but also, um, you know, Nancy, uh, paper you talked about um, kind of strategic thinking about um, you know how can we um, is there such a thing as near perfect intelligence is that something that um, bureaucracies can even aspire to and Reg I would um, ask you to explore this as well from your historical perspective um, so um, maybe uh, Reg um, can I start with you on that one um. Yeah, um, well, I think that lessons have been learned uh, and uh, that's one of the uh, of the of the upsides of the Canadian story since uh, since the end of, uh, of World War Two. And uh, part of it is, in fact, the growth of accountability structures. And when you were operating in a situation in which there was virtually an absence of accountability, um, it was really dancing in the dark and uh, nobody was getting seeing much uh, that was going on inside until something really terrible happened like you know the canadian ambassador commits suicide or something like that uh suddenly there's a there's a there's an issue uh but the the growth of accountability uh structures over the last few years and we've had a whole range of innovations just in the last uh you know in the last handful of years uh, now, uh, and some of the institutions that are just sort of finding their feet right now and, and finding their place. But uh, accountability structures also alert uh, the agencies uh, to the dangers and, and to the risks. And once you take account of those, I think you can, in fact, uh, be more innovative and, and uh, and creative without uh, the fear of, uh, of simply, uh, you know, just making, uh, getting into the headlines, which is what the last thing that any intelligence agency wants to see happen. Absolutely, thank you very much. Yeah, I think uh, they live in fear of that one. Um, Nancy, would you like to um, approach that question from your own perspective? Thanks very much, Heather. And forgive me for speaking so quickly earlier to the interpreters. Oh. Trying to slow it down. <laughs> There's been a lot of coffee. Um, so I guess what I'll speak to is the fog and the silos aspect um, in terms of achieving near perfect intelligence. So what I'm thinking about, um, because uh, the current systems, this integrated network, um, you know, of layered sensors and whatnot is in development. So a lot of um, how would I say, uh, findings from current testing and things like that uh, it probably needs to remain classified and might remain classified into the future. Um, but what I want to say now is that achieving perfect intelligence is probably um, an asymptotic uh, um, objective. Um, you'll always get very, very close, but never fully achieve it. And the reasons for that is what I described in terms of adversaries seeking to offset with asymmetric capabilities. And I highlighted some of these being, um, uh, you know, uh, to deceive or conceal capabilities um, and using disinformation. And what I'm thinking about here goes way back to Sun Tzu in a way is, um, a, Dis, dis, um, disguising one's weaknesses and disguising one's strengths and kind of using distraction through dis and misinformation. So we really need to kind of explore that, that uh, direction. Um, and of course, the other challenge is in terms of the silos and whatnot is not just overcoming um, silos between the military branches and the branches, um, you know, other government develop, um, departments and things like that. And I'm not going to touch on the combatant commands. Uh, there's better experts who can address that kind of uh, level, um, but that plays a role here too. But um, in how uh, 
allies and partners will be integrated. For example, Canada is investing significantly um, in the Pathfinder initiative uh, that ends sometime this fall, um, but it's demonstrating um, some success in being able to pick up data um, that you know, was never able to find before using a combination of old and new systems, et cetera. Um, but there's going to be a lot of challenges with the processes and how to integrate, you know, allies into those systems, especially with this kind of look globally, you know, not just for regional defense, but kind of a global look. Um, so I guess because um, these processes are still in development, um, I can only say for now, uh, we'll have to see what happens, but uh, I'm optimistic. <laughs> That's excellent. Thank you. Yes, we all we all have to strive to remain optimistic right, to continue uh, to work in this space. Um, Patrick, uh, from the Australian perspective. That, thanks, Heather. Um, look, I don't. I think um, near perfect intelligence is a nirvana state, and perhaps that's we'll never get to that space. But we can always do better. And obviously, given the security environment becomes much more uh, volatile, uncertain. Uh, we do need to do better, and, and that's I, uh, I sort of um, applaud the conference organisers for focusing on intel cooperation because that's very going to be very much not only within each of, each of our intel communities, but uh, you know across the five eyes and other strategic partners. That will be the way of the future, um, and it's not just partnership with intelligence agencies with intelligence agencies, but it's also going to be some of the other things I mentioned in my paper about academic outreach. Now, Canada, as, as the Canadians know, had a, for over 10 years a very good uh, academic outreach program based at CSIS, which, uh, you know, has uh, periodically funds workshops uh, that invites academics and outside experts as a kind of open source intel gathering exercise of their own, publishes those papers, an open source version, and, uh, I, you know, invites scholars to headquarters in Ottawa, which I've been there twice, um, two books I've written, talking to analysts, exchanging information and you know these are the sort of things which you know, all intelligence agencies should be certainly that this is what the Australian intelligence community isn't doing but should be doing more of um, and so it's exchange it's getting out of those uh, agencies and getting your people your staff to understand how other people see these issues who might know more than you about these issues for example in academia and uh, in the private sector the ONI is just the Office of National Intelligence, which I was just mentioning before, which is the new sort of super coordinating agency in our community, has stood up a National Intelligence Science and Advisory Board, which, which is, brings all those sort of senior heads of Intel, um, it's chaired by ONI, and has senior academics on it from across the country to try and help ONI work out how to strategize, how to connect with the academic community, how to identify research priorities, and, and capability issues. So it's still got a long way to go in terms of working out what actually it's supposed to be doing, but there's sort of some of the mechanisms that, that we need, need to look at. We also need to have more visiting academic uh, fellows coming into our intelligence agencies, working with analysts as subject matter experts or capability experts on certain issues um, that can bring in, uh, who are obviously vetted, but can bring in trusted external uh, perspectives and knowledge to kind of churn the waters because sometimes in the Intel community because of the Intel security structure, you know, the whole, the whole, if you think about the whole physical space of Intel, they're not to, they're, they're to keep people out, not to let them come in. And so we need to find ways to bring these people in to, to build these kind of, break these silos down and to build better evidence around assessments and capabilities. Thank you for that. Um, and just, um, Patrick, I'm going to go to the chat and just picking up on, I think, your uh, last couple of points there. We have a question uh, from Jim Cox. Does Australia have a formal structured professional development education program for future intelligence leaders, say, at the Australian National University? And I think that's very much in sync with what you were just mentioning. Yeah, um, well, the Australian National University at the National Security College um, has um, the short term programs that they um, bring in sort of middle ranking managers to talk about, they like seminars, talk about issues of, of leadership importance of, uh, you know, kind of threat, sort of threat issues or organisational institutional issues. So that, 
Um, but I'm obviously at Charles Sturt University and we've had an Intel program since 1999. We have an intelligence management subject within our Master of Arts Intel Analysis. And um, this is an area though, intelligence leadership, which is pr pretty much underbaked in both academia and intelligence practice. And I just published a book uh, in November last year on intelligence leadership, uh, where I surveyed over 200 current and former Intel leaders. I talked to people like Jim Clapper, I've talked to some head, former heads of CSIS. Uh, uh, and, and really what it's about is because after 9-11, people were sort of saying, well, you know, we need to do more for our analysts, which is obviously true. But no one's actually has been talking about, well, what are the future middle ranking CSIS managers or CES, CSE managers? You know, do we just assume that they just circulate through the Canadian bureaucracy and they've got the skills to become the future heads of these agencies? Or So what kind of leadership attributes do we want these people to have? And what kind of security complexities and environments and institutional issues are they going to be confronted with? So the book was is about that. And I think, I guess what I'm trying to say is, I, th I think our leadership training uh, across the five, as far as I understand it and know it, is at where it needs to be. Thank you for that. I, I, you know, that's been an interesting rolling conversation throughout the day, kind of the expertise that intelligence professionals uh, need to be. And, um, you know, it's with, like with any discipline, I think I've um, heard uh, folks saying, at least from my own personal experiences, you can have uh, generalists um, who come from, you know, backgrounds of history, of political science, of economics, language, etc. But you, you really do need to develop specific competencies, whether it be in the assessment space or collection space, but also as you move up to become um, an executive leader in uh, these intelligence collection organizations. Um, because, you know, if you're an intelligence analyst, you need to um, kind of lose the specialization and what, what made you uh, the unique analyst that you were to move up into um, the executive space and then be a decision decision maker. So these are, um, I think, important questions for um, all of us. Um, we're getting some nice questions here. Um, I'll move to um, just a specific one uh, for Nancy. Um, uh, what impact will the advent of hypersonic weaponry have on the latency of ISR systems? Will ISR systems become even more autonomous? Excellent question. Okay, so there's a debate <laughs> in uh, the strategic field about um, whether hypersonics really are a game changer or not. Um, and I'll just explain why. Um, because uh, re-entry vehicles of ballistic missiles um, are often faster. And because some of them have uh, re um, maneuverability uh, as much as a hypersonic does from the ionosphere into the atmosphere, um, you know, at a, so there's discussion whether um, whether they actually change anything. So, um, but because uh, the need to upgrade ISR capabilities, particularly for North American defense, right? We've read um, at length about the challenges of the North Warning System that's kind of becoming obsolete and how we need to upgrade, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and one of the challenges is being able to see over the horizon and things like that, and to be able to anticipate um, threats as they uh, emerge rather than you know trying to uh, deal with them after the launch is also part of that equation. Um, so it's, it's difficult to say because um, a lot of the material that would um, argue that hypersonics do play a significant role as a game changer in um, upgrading ISR capabilities, a lot of it's classified. Um, so it's, it's hard to know. So arguments out there are that, you know, they can still be somewhat detectable, you know, they're still comparable to the impact of ballistic missile reentry vehicles. Um, missile defenses can still potentially um, uh, intercept them in the terminal phase, maybe not the mid-course phase, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so there's a debate there. I would say that the real question would be about cruise missiles and um, hypersonic uh, speeds that they may achieve in the next generation cruise missiles. Um, so that is going to be a huge uh, consideration of being able to adapt ISR capabilities to anticipate. Um, and that also calls into question, how do you respond? And are you going to respond? How much to the left do you respond? And in which ways, right? There's all, always non-kinetic ways to respond to the left. That does involve things that no one's really thinking about, not just targeting launch platforms, but actually engaging in a dialogue. Uh, so engaging in diplomacy, which plays a significant role in 
you know, the role of intelligence in early warning and anticipation and predicting. Um, so I would, I would start thinking, you know, look into the debate on the hypersonics. It's not off the table, but I would say the, the debate, uh, the discussion really applies, I would say, to next generation cruise missiles. So I hope that answers your question. <laughs> Apologies, I hadn't unmuted. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, okay, great. Um, apologies. Um, thank you very much uh, for that, Nancy. And we can have a follow up in the chat um, if uh, we didn't get to the crux of your question. Um, a question um, from Troy Buffard, specifically for Patrick, but if the other panelists would like to comment on uh, cooperation with Japan, uh, the admission of Japan in the Five Eyes would seem quite complicated given their lack of an established enterprise to handle sensitive information, i.e. there's little confidence Japan could prevent information from being compromised. What are your thoughts on this, please? And again, um, Nancy and Reg, if you have uh, some commentary on uh, kind of partnership with uh, Japan, either from a historical perspective um, or currently, uh, that would be welcomed. So I'll turn it to Patrick. Okay, thanks, Hilla. Um, well, I, that's a very good question, and I, I, I sort of scratched that a bit in my full paper, which um, people can have a look at. Look, that's been an ongoing concern with Japan um, in terms of its counterintelligence capabilities, whether it ha is, can actually store and use and share, you know, you know safely, if I can put it that way, intelligence with allies. Um, and there's been a lot of work done on that in recent years um, and the Shinzo Abe period of security, new security laws about, you know, uh, sanctioning people if they share classified information and whether or not they're not supposed to share it. And there's been a lot more space uh, from uh, what I understand, a lot more work done on the SIGINT agency over there and it's in its um, protection of its information, critical infrastructure. But the, the sense I get is there's still a lot, quite rightly, as the um, question it sort of underscores, there's a lot more work to be done in this space. Um, and so um, there is that still that lack of confidence, I think, in, in, in Japan. And, you know, that just like the Australia and the US, uh, Japan has uh, suffered recently under several, you know, critical cyber attacks um, during COVID. Uh, which sort of underscores again whether the Intel enterprise is ready to be plugged in, if I can put it in those terms, to a sort of Five Eye Alliance uh, situation. So, yeah, the, the answer to the question is I think it's still a work in progress. Thank you very much. Nancy or Reg, would you like to comment on this question? Um, perhaps I, I would uh, just. And, and maybe it's a question for Patrick, actually, for me, but uh, the Five Eyes has always struck me as a primarily Anglosphere kind of intelligence community. And the culture that has built up over the decades uh, within that, and it has never precluded, of course, cooperation with other countries where it was appropriate, and, uh, and they have from time to time, but not as partners within that uh, essential uh, five group of five. And uh, I, I just wonder if, if in the case of Japan, if, it, if it's just perhaps a bit of a stretch um, into something rather different. I, I mean, New Zealand is now questioning some of the directions of, uh, of the five eyes in terms of becoming a little bit more of a diplomatic alliance than, a, uh, than an intelligence alliance. So obviously there are a lot of of, uh, of changes in the air, but I wonder if this is just maybe something a bit too far. Patrick, did you want to comment? Um, look, I think, uh, as I sort of say in my paper, essentially, I think, I mean, there's a lot of talk, and there's the um, Taro Aso, who's uh, currently the sort of Japanese minister for COVID, but I think was the cabinet. Secretary and uh, Shinzo Abe, so very influential. That's you know the cabinet secretary of Japan is a kind of very influential person, and he was very much you know personally in favour of Japan joining the Five Eyes, and there is talk about him becoming the next prime minister after um, uh, Prime Minister Suga, if if that was to happen, and that so there you sort of think well maybe he might push this sort of six eyes agenda more, given he was always very pro it. But there's also moving parts, and as Reg 
has said, this is an Anglo cultural kind of setup since the Second World War. Um, and already, you know, Japan and Australia cooperate significantly militarily in intelligence with Japan. Um, and so then what is then, you know, the value add and it is, you know, Japan is a different set of cultural issues and constraints with its intelligence community. I think um, we're not talking about immediately, we're not even talking probably in the short to medium term. It's hard to know, but I think it really depends on, uh, on, on China, really. I think it really depends on how, um, how that, the, the relationship between China and the United States uh, and Australia and other key partners in the Indo-Pacific, how much that deteriorates and how quickly that deteriorates might dictate whether Japan, you know, kind of is escalated into to the six eyes uh, or, or the other option is, you know, that there, there are just more formalised ways of sharing a lot more intelligence than we currently do with Japan on a whole range of issues. Um, it's sort of a separate protected channel, which doesn't mean we're sort of plugging everything in and then becoming a six-sized partner. But I think the, the, sort of it's a bit of a wild card and the unknown variable is really how China, the, China's posture and how that will play out, you know, increasingly over the next, say, sort of five years in, in this region. Thank you. Um, Nancy, did you want to chime in? Actually, I have to say this is entirely out of my area, so I defer to my colleagues <laughs> and their expertise on this. No problem. Trying to be inclusive. Um, but I think that um, our participants as well um, online are um, starting to um, absorb all of your commentaries and think about multipolarity and geopolitics. We're getting some really interesting questions along those themes. So why don't I pose one, um, which I think is quite relevant um, in many ways, and, and a pertinent question um, from different perspectives, um, you know, Reg, you just spoke about, you know, the Five Eyes being primarily um, an Anglophoner, and, you know, we know the language of intelligence is English, um, and yet we had, uh, for example, Daniel Jean speaking earlier about, um, you know, uh, Canada and its, its Francophone role, um, the role in Haiti, and so, you know, um, uh, middle powers uh, in particular, sometimes they have levers that they can pull that um, can contribute to uh, strategic objectives for the, for the larger whole. So taking all of that into account, um, we have a question, uh, what space for cooperation is there with the global south? And uh, Patrick, uh, I think from our perspective here in the south, uh, so we'll, uh, we'll use this as non-traditional partners maybe, or partners in uh, non-traditional areas. Um, say academic exchange, capacity building, information sharing, knowledge sharing for legislative reform? And I think that's a, an interesting question for, um, for everyone. Um, as you're absorbing that, uh, is there somebody who would like to go first? No? Patrick, then I'll ask you if you don't mind. That's okay. Um, I'm fully awake now. I've had my first coffee. Um, so I'm now engaged. Um, uh, so look, I, I think um, as a sort of general principle, uh, it's in the national interest of Australia and other Five Eyes countries to cooperate with any intelligence service with any country that it can uh, gain knowledge of, of a threat of mutual interest, uh, assist in developing capabilities. We see that on a lot in the law enforcement space uh, in Australia. Uh, the, you know, the federal police here in, in Australia, and I'm sure the RCMP does this in Canada, has countries where uh, there's a lot of uh, transnational organised crime pressure points in Southeast Asia or in Europe, where um, the federal police will bring people over for investigation training or intelligence training. Um, and some of our national security agencies do that as well, because it's, it's a way of building trust. It's a way of those confidence building measures, those small kind of training people, um, working out how to work together technically, understanding mutual cooperation and, and, and legislation, all of those things builds trust and, and in partners that you don't, you know, don't have a long history like the Five Eyes with. So I think, I think um, and it's certainly we've seen since 9-11, um, the kind of countries that United States, Australia, uh, Canada um, have reached out to, yeah, for intelligence, um, in, particularly in the Middle East and even in Africa, 
has been extraordinary. And of course, with that has come some of the concerns we've had traditionally around uh, around after 9-11, leading up uh, you know, to the invasion of Afghanistan and, and the invasion of Iraq and coercive interrogation. Obviously, Reg before mentioned the, the Mohammed Arar case, uh, which after that case, you know, ceases became a lot more focused on the provenance of intelligence. Where, where does this task come from? We need to know where it comes from. So there's lots of issues, or there's also opportunities uh, for doing good things, but there's also, you know, sort of shoals in the in the shallow waters that intelligence communities need to navigate in terms of you know, who you're cooperating with, you know, are these liberal democracies? Do they have the same values as us? How do we, you know, how is it possible to get the information, but at the same time, uh, not expose ourselves to um, uh, issues that, you know, that uh, we wouldn't want to see in the, in the paper the next day in ways that are deleterious to the reputation of our intel agencies or our countries. Uh, yeah, I, uh, just just add um, a bit of a caution, I guess. Um, and I struck um, in in the last year or two by Canadian policy in regard to Venezuela, uh, and and just what a kind of rat's nest you can get into when you move into you know, basically uh, trying to encourage regime change within a situation in which your intelligence clearly is is uh, very limited. And in fact, that effort failed abysmally, <laughs> as we know. Um, so it, 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 you know, let, let's just say that, uh, like test the ground well before you, you move into more open uh, kind of engagement. Uh, that's all I'll say. Indeed. Uh, Nancy, anything in your specific world? No? Um, okay, thank you very much for that. Um, fascinating. Um, I will, um, let's see, we have two more. Um, I think there's one really nice one on multipolarity that might be a nice way to wrap up um, everything. I'm trying to manage time. So we'll go to a very uh, specific question um, before we do that one, Nancy, and I'll do my best, I think, for the final kind of round uh, when we get there um, to title together with a question that you can approach from all your perspectives. So Nancy, specifically um, from Jim Cox, Canada's ISR systems are traditionally oriented terrestrially. What ISR capability do we have oriented to space? What does it do? So I've been starting to explore some of this um, because uh, Canada is becoming more integrated into that North American defense architecture. Um, so I believe RadarSat um, was fully launched was it about a year or so ago. Um, and so that's a three constellations to be able to provide um, a persistent uh, imagery and whatnot of um, the northern regions. Um, and uh, my other understanding is that Canada has a satellite called Sapphire that um, indirectly uh, contributes to early warning for ballistic missile defense, um, but it goes through kind of a convoluted process, uh, but it is part of this kind of broader architecture because early warning essentially should be a part of what Canada does. Um, so yeah, Canada's one of these uh, key players in uh, developing space-based capabilities for enhancing ISR for uh, North American defense, um, which does have uh, broader applications abroad. Um, so that's kind of the extent of my uh, understanding of um, the space-based assets in which Canada is contributing. My understanding is that uh, these are um, developing further and as they become integrated with other domains, right, because the whole key is all domain awareness, um, it will be, um, a It'll be, uh, I'll be able to better understand um, how all these systems are coming together. Um, but like I mentioned earlier about this whole Pathfinder initiative, um, it, these, these integrated systems are picking up more and more data that um, when humans were in the loop, uh, we're unable to necessarily find and see the same patterns that, because you asked a question earlier that I didn't get the second half of, um, of the automated uh, aspects. So these automated, you know, 
um, artificial intelligence and machine learning are able to see patterns and to see data and to make connections that humans couldn't. So you have a human on the loop rather than in the loop that, you know, is a consumer and able to, you know, think about the various options and things like that generated by uh, these capabilities. So um, space is a, a, an aspect of that Canada as a key contributor. Um, but there's also multiple systems that are, are being pulled into this old and new, which is really significant because that's a very cost effective approach to being able to um, capitalize on all these different capabilities. So hope that answers your question. Thank you. Um, so picking up from that in terms of um, Nancy, you've really enlightened us today, I think, on uh, questions around technology um, and, and targets. And um, we've talked throughout the day, I think, on artificial intelligence and big data, et cetera. I think this question um, is relevant for everybody. But if we think about it in the bigger context, too, I'll, I'll throw this in um, to add on top of the question. You know, we're in the middle of a pandemic, which has really laid bare uh, vulnerabilities. Um, Nancy, you spoke about cyber earlier. Um, but we're, you know, we've seen vulnerabilities in the economic security space, people are working from home, etc. Um, so for all participants to kind of think about how this last year has um, changed the world for sure, but has um, created some really interesting challenges and opportunities for intelligence cooperation and intelligence collection. Um, so if you could comment on that um, more specifically, but our uh, question from uh, Jean-Noël Berroubet is, um, can we identify in real time the targets of the sectors affected in Canada by the recent computer attacks during the COVID-19 pandemic in order to strengthen our strategic cooperation links with our NATO allies to try and identify the common pattern to foresee together more precisely the next major attack to happen on all IT systems of NATO member countries in order to better prepare for it. So um, just I'll encourage um, pan panelists that want to respond to that specifically, but also uh, the, you know, the bigger question around uh, the opportunities and challenges of, of the pandemic, lessons learned, um, even from your perspective, Reg, um, historically, and how we can um, be more strategic um, to ensure that we are identifying threats, uh, as you say, Nancy, uh, before they happen. So do I have a volunteer to attack this one first? I, I can go ahead if you like, Heather. So at the moment, um, uh, me, myself, uh, with some colleagues, uh, one in Canada, Queen's University, uh, epidemiologists at University of South Wales, um, and um, myself, who's the ex-Intel guy, someone else from the Intel community, we we're, we're put a research grant in, which we'll hopefully find out in November whether we're successful. We're looking at the what are the principles for building an effective health security intelligence early warning system that both national security agencies and public health agencies can collaborate on and usefully use. And people would be aware in Canada, there's been a big review of GPHIN, uh, you know, at the moment and, and how that failed to kind of predict COVID, if I can put it in those terms. Uh, but there's been plenty of these other things in the last 20 years that have developed like the Google flu and so on, these digital kind of uh, driven early warning systems for health that haven't really done a lot to um, kind of provide early warning of disease. And, and the question is not trying to predict the specific next virus. The question is having more warning so you don't get to a situation where you are really literally shutting down the Australian economy or the Canadian economy and putting it in hibernation. We can't be, I think nations can't be in the situation again. You know, so. Anyway, the point is that that's what we're going to do in the grant. And I'm also talking to other Canadian colleagues at CG uh, about health security and how the Canadian intelligence community needs to be better prepared for uh, the next pandemic. And that, you know, the intelligence communities haven't traditionally seen pandemics. The rhetoric's getting there, but traditionally they haven't seen them as, you know, hard national security issues like they would see, you know, bioterrorism, for example. But health security, I, I like the term health security because it puts everything on that perspective. And we don't know when, when there's a pandemic, we don't know if it's intentional or unintentional until we get Intel people together and the national security people together and the, and the health people together to understand what it is. Is it accidental, is it intentional, unintentional? And so I think there's a big, huge opportunity that hopefully won't go to waste. And we've seen Biden trying to already you know, improve the biodefense that kind of was ripped out under the Trump administration in the United States. 
there is a potential here for the Five Eyes to do a lot more, and, and countries like the Five Eyes, to do a lot more in a coordinated way to bring together the expertise of the, their national intelligence security apparatus with public health, the broader public health policy makers. And these are like two tribes that don't easily well talk to each other or like necessarily to be in the same room. But I think we don't want to have another pandemic like this. And I think that means there's an urgency to get rid of, to bring those two tribes together, public health and national security, particularly around early warning, but also about sharing information and how to how one of the <clears throat> each of those tribes can learn off the others is I think the critical thing we need to do next. Thank you for that. Um, it's a, a theme I think we've heard throughout as well today that the client base for intelligence products and intelligence assessments has really expanded exponentially during the past 12 months in a way that um, we uh, have not seen before. And how do we formalize those relationships? How do we get clearances uh, for people who need them? How do you move documentation or have classified conversations? Um, these are things that um, we never really contemplated before. So thank you very much for that. Reg or Nancy, did you want to comment? Uh, yeah, perhaps I could uh, just uh, say a few words about this. And I agree completely. And, and uh, it's a huge challenge to, uh, in effect, recast the whole concept of intelligence as it has been understood for, for decades uh, into this broader context. But let me broaden it even further, because it's not just the pandemic. It's also the climate crisis. And in both cases, there, there's a similarities uh, that come out of this, that this is nature uh, and, uh, and, and our relationship to, uh, to, the, uh, to nature and, and nature striking back in, in many ways. And, and how do we cope with that? And, uh, and, and the, the, there's going to be a huge challenge coming up, um, coming out of the pandemic with, um, the conversion away from fossil fuel economies and, and so on, and the impact that's going to have differentially on different countries, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But just let me just pose that I was struck by uh, Daniel Jean was talking about the uh, reemergence of bipolarity uh, in the contemporary world with the two giants of China and the US confronting each other increasingly. And the challenge that that poses in this regard, because if we're going to deal with issues like the pandemic or with climate change, we absolutely require cooperation with China in, in, uh, across a whole range of matters. And how that is going to be handled at the same time as, uh, the, as the, the superpower conflict, in effect, deepens uh, around the world is going to be a very difficult challenge for and, and intelligence is in a sense split in a way between the old and the new here uh, in terms of what their perspective on, on this is going to be. Thank you very much for that. Uh, indeed, multifaceted partnerships within bipolar uh, power dynamics, not simple. Nancy, did you want to comment on this particular question? And I know we're 4.58, so you would have the last word of this question, and then I'll, I'll wrap it up with one final comment and question. I'll keep it limited because uh, it is a limited answer. <laughs> um, so I'm going back to the, um, I guess, the evolution and response to COVID, for example, and being able to anticipate these things. Um, so what I'm aware of, uh, at, uh, you know, in terms of this issue is that um, I believe it was General Van Hurt that reported on the uh, effectiveness of the um, of Judge C2 and bringing information together and helping coordinate the dissemination of that information and patterns and, and, and things like that uh, with um, the uh, increasing numbers in places, for example, in uh, New York and being able to coordinate the military branches to assist other government departments and, of course, the health services in responding quickly to accommodate the increasing numbers. Um, and, of course, as we know, this is coming through uh, NORTHCOM, which is tasked with uh, homeland defense and, of course, emergency response, right? Um, so this was kind of the first test of the effectiveness of this, uh, this new system, um, and uh, it, it demonstrated success, and uh, so that provides kind of opportunity to think about how would this kind of work on a broader continental or uh, global uh, scale. Uh, so I'll leave it at that and uh, thank you. 
Well, thank you very much. And thanks to all of our participants um, online who've uh, sent us very provocative questions. Um, I will, um, I'll stop the questioning there, um, but I just wanted to thank our panelists because I, my last question was really going to be, um, considering many of the participants today are students, what the lines of inquiry are, the urgent lines of inquiry um, for students and for the next um, generation of thinkers in this space. Um, and we all know it's urgent work, uh, considering the stakes that you have all demonstrated to us um, are so high within intelligence cooperation. But your presentations have shone uh, a very clear light, I think, for all of us listening, um, lucky enough to listen to you today about kind of the, uh, the, re the need for uh, research and further discussion in this space. So a uh, hearty thank you to all of you from different time zones, much appreciated, and to our participants um, uh, online. And I turn it back over to Justin and or Toma, I think, and I thank you for the opportunity to be able to participate today. Thank you uh, very much, Heather. Uh, so I will uh, just close off the uh, the day. I will be very brief. Normally, I, at the end of a conference, I like to do a synthesis of the key themes of the day, uh, but not really now because I think we're all a bit uh, zoomed out after uh, not just today, but 14 months. I just want to highlight uh, four very quick points on the day. Uh, First of all, as, uh, as we mentioned at the beginning of the day, uh, one of our goals today was to broaden the scope of intelligence studies beyond uh, the US. Uh, as we all know, a good chunk of the literature on intelligence is uh, focused on the US uh, completely, or at least in large part. That's normal to some extent, but there's a need for more case studies. And, and one of our objectives with the day uh, today and with uh, the eventual publication is to provide uh, more public uh, information uh, on how do other states engage in intelligence cooperation. Point number two, and this is something that Heather mentioned uh, in the last panel and that was mentioned throughout the day, is the need uh, for uh, not only the intelligence community itself to broaden its client-based uh, universities, private sector research, civil society, businesses, government departments that are not the traditional security players, as we mentioned throughout the day, but the corollary to that is for those who study intelligence, for the media who report on intelligence, et cetera, to broaden their own focus, uh, to look at these uh, diversifying partnerships that intelligence uh, players are increasingly developing all over the place. Point number three is a broader one, is the importance of public debate on, on intelligence matters. Uh, here in Canada, uh, and for that matter, anywhere else in the world. But here in Canada, we do not talk about intelligence a lot. The media doesn't focus on it a lot. Academics, uh, not that much, even though, as Stephanie Carvin said uh, earlier today, there is more and more uh, very recently, but there's a need to, to continue that. Uh, so uh, thank you to, to all the speakers for having contributed to that today. And thank you in particular, I would like to say to the three chairs and to the keynote speaker who are either serving or retired, recently retired practitioners in national security or intelligence. Um, there is uh, not a lot of, of public uh, participation participation public debates by retired practitioners in Canada. And when it happens, it's very useful because it brings an informed perspective that we frankly don't have enough. Uh, so to the four of you uh, in particular, thanks a lot. Et, et le quatrième et dernier point que je voudrais faire, c'est de dire exactement la même chose que ce que je viens de dire, mais spécifiquement dans le contexte du Québec. Euh, si c'est vrai qu'au Canada, on ne parle pas beaucoup de euh, questions de renseignement, au Québec, on en parle encore moins. Euh, et et ce n'est pas un reproche à qui que ce soit, je pense que c'est juste une réalité, que ce soit dans les médias, que ce soit dans le milieu universitaire, que ce soit nos politiciens, mais en français, il est très rarement question euh, de, de questions de renseignement euh, en français. Alors, je pense que euh, euh, ce soit en français ou en tout cas au Québec comme aujourd'hui. Alors, euh, s'il y en a euh, dans ceux qui sont encore avec nous aujourd'hui qui euh, envisageaient parmi les étudiants, les étudiantes en particulier, une carrière éventuellement dans le milieu du renseignement de la sécurité nationale, j'espère que la journée d'aujourd'hui va vous avoir aidé un peu à euh, comprendre un peu mieux ce qui se passe et j'espère vous, vous encourager. So to conclude, uh, thank you to uh, everybody. Thank you to the speakers uh, in particular. Uh, thank you, as I just said, to the chairs and the keynote. Uh, thank you, of course, to Justin Massy, who was the driving force behind uh, the organization of the day. Thank you to MINDS, uh, the Department of National Defense's academic engagement program, who, uh, uh, which supports uh, the uh, Network for Strategic Analysis 
the very fortunately named NSA, uh, that is the, uh, uh, the, the institution that, that supported uh, this event. Uh, thank you also in particular to Chloe Berla, Catherine poul bourque Marco Meunier, and Jonathan Maine, who uh, were the muscle that really made this event possible. Uh, and finally, thank you to everybody who uh, attended the event and especially those who uh, made it until the very end. So on that, uh, merci beaucoup uh, et uh, bonne uh, fin de journée. And I'm sorry, I overread that. Thank you to the translators uh, who uh, very bravely and in difficult conditions uh, in a virtual context uh, provided this indispensable uh, service. Uh, so on that, I am truly done. Merci beaucoup. Bonne fin de journée et on espère vous voir en personne un jour. Bonne soirée.